If everyone will go ahead and take your seats now, we're going to go ahead and begin our class for today. Thank you for being here. And all of you were here for our last one. So uh, I'm glad to see the two new people. So you're very much welcome to be here. I want to be sure to talk to you at the class uh, so we can meet. I uh, <clears throat> mentioned to you last time I went a little longer than what I had planned to, and I really appreciate that you stayed. Today we're going to be shorter in presentation. We're going to break out uh, the series in uh, our class 101 into several classes, and these are going to deal primarily with helping helping us to understand several things. Uh, in introducing today's class, which I'll do a short introduction for each one, uh, our agenda here is is we're introducing by detailed analysis and study, certain events from uh, biblical history in uh, the setting of the antiquities. And we consider anything in the antiquities to be uh, from the time of the writing of the Bible back. In other words, uh, in alpha time. We've explained what alpha time is. Uh, today, uh, we're continuing and uh, giving a foundation for some terms and some uh, information in the sciences that you're going to need to know, in order to be in order to be able to assimilate and understand our view, uh, our stated view, which we're going to uh, do that with this series of classes, as to the historical fact of the flood of Noah's day. Now, a lot of folks, I'm going to say just this in introduction today. Uh, a lot of folks are under the misconception that the scriptures actually uh, necessitate that all of the high mountain peaks of the earth were submerged under water during the flood. Let me correct that assumption. Some were. Some were definitely under the water, completely submerged. And up, out on other parts of the earth, the waters were up on every high mountain. There's a distinction there. And we're going to explain uh, quite a bit about the meteorological stir of events that were in conjunction with uh, the many other uh, cataclysmic events going on at that time. And I want to point out right now as we go along, uh, we are definitely faith-based in our Christian faith. We do believe the Bible. We believe it's important that we correctly interpret the wording of the Bible and, and that we apply it, uh, that it is of God. Now, in saying that, we're going to also be examining uh, the information from the landscape literatures. Now, before we read the accounts of uh, Noah's experience and the times of Noah, the things that went on, we're going to introduce uh, quite a bit of scientific information here. To come up. Today's class is catalog number 101-04, and we're going to do some introductory into the geophysics. Uh, primarily, we're going to be talking about plate tectonics today, tectonics, and introduction. We're not going to do a detailed uh examination of the science of volcanology or plate tectonics in the sense that we're going to do any calculations or anything. Uh, but it is absolutely necessary that to understand the events that took place during the time of Noah, we have to understand at least the principles involved in the uh, planetary geophysics that took place at Earth and uh, activities such as the uh, theoretics and the applications of plate tectonics. And it will help us when we get down to reading the text and using MDCV and ADP. We're going to extract some statements that are going to just really bring some things out. We're going to model an understanding of what took place. We're going to be exploring the related sciences connected to the catastrophic events of the Great Flood of Noah's time. So let's get started. I'll probably have to adjust my camera a little bit here. Now this is not absolutely to scale by any means, but we're going to give you 
just a little introductory here and some very basic science um, as to the composition as, as we believe it to be. Uh, no one, uh, we've been to the moon. Mankind has been to the moon more than once. And we learned a lot in that experience, but no one has been to the core of the earth. And we have never been able to send a machine to the core of the earth. So bear in mind our understanding of the interior of the earth, the place, the planet upon which we live, is technically, by measurement and observation, we know less about it than we do the surface of the moon. So having said that, we're going to use some standard academic science to help us understand some things that go on on the surface of the earth that are related to things that happen just under the surface of the earth. Now, <clears throat> our lithosphere is this part that is labeled here, the rigid mantle. That's the solid part of the surface of the earth upon which we live. We refer to this as the crust of the earth. And underneath us, just down uh, a certain distance, which it varies in different parts of the world, just a few miles, a few kilometers down, is the asthenosphere, which is a, a more plastic uh, layer of the, the Earth's mantle. Under that we have the areas which would be called, and this is not to scale, by the way, the stiffer mantle. And these are major, major distinctions here. Uh, these are not broken down. The, the outer uh, lithosphere of the Earth, where we do our uh, seismic uh, petroleum research, etc., in itself has several uh, layers that are not shown here on this chart. So we're just giving you an idea that the Earth, as far as its composition goes, we do know that the Earth is only solid, uh, just a thin layer of its actual diameter. So going from a radius of the center out, we're going through gaseous and molten layers of composition elements and compounds. And we live on the very thin skin of the earth, which we call the uh, lithosphere. Now upon the lithosphere, we have the oceans and the continents. The oceans are covering uh, approximately two-thirds of the surfaces of, of the earth. The liquid that's called the hydrosphere. Now let's go on over here, and I'm going to have to hold this up for you. This is just another view. And this kind of showing transitional areas. And again, they are not to scale, and they are not that well defined. Uh, there's transition areas, uh, but the idea being at the center of the Earth, it's a very hot molten core. And it's very hot all the way up until we get to this very thin layer up here on the crust of the Earth, the lithosphere where we live, where our oceans and our continents are found up here. So that being said, now that we give you just a little bit of a picture, and I apologize that really we're not showing it in greater detail to you. Let's get down to uh, talking about plate tectonics and just what they're going to mean to us in this course. <clears throat> I'm going to have to adjust my camera for you here just a little bit for those folks looking in on our and participating with us in, uh, through our YouTube audience class. Lithosphere is it, pronounced lithosphere. In geology, is the solid portion of the Earth, distinguished from the atmosphere or the hydrosphere. The atmosphere being the gaseous envelope around the Earth, which has our clouds, and where we experience our meteorology and weather. The hydrosphere would be basically uh, our oceans and seas, the liquid H2O accumulations, and ice it includes our... Uh, ice caps. The crust of the upper mantle of the earth is our lithosphere. The lithosphere is differentiated by description as being a solid. It is not liquid. 
and it's not considered a plastic surface, even though there are a certain amount of movements that go on. A solid, by definition, having three dimensions, length, breadth, and thickness, as a geometrical body or figure, of or pertaining to bodies or figures of three dimensions, having the interior completely filled up, free from cavities, or not hollow, without openings or breaks, a solid wall, firm, hard, or compact in substance, such as solid ground. That's considered solid. So when we say something is solid, we're talking about as far as its uh, definition, compaction, etc. No cavities or voids. Plate tectonics. Now here we go with this term. First of all, let me say that plate tectonics is a relatively new science, historically. Uh, the theories of plate tectonics began in the 1940s and have been developed hand-in-hand uh, hand pretty much uh, with the uh, mapping technologies and uh, volcanology being the major science that looks at plate tectonics. Uh, plate tectonics is a geo geological theory that explains the phenomenon of continental drift, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. According to the theory, the Earth's crust is made up of continental and oceanic plates, which move across the surface of the planet, which would be on the mantle core, uh, not the oceans, like we think of things floating or drifting, but drifting more on the sub subterranean uh, molten layers. Plate tectonics cause volcanic activity, mountain building, ocean trench formation, and earthquakes. Very important. Uh, plate tectonics. We're going to need to understand some things about that for our discussion about the flood during Noah's time, along with some astrophysics. Continental drift. The theory of continental drift was first proposed by Alfred Wegener in 1915. It had long been noted that continental coastlines appeared to fit together like giant puzzle pieces, most notably the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. Wegener hypothesized that a supercontinent named Pangaea existed some 200 million years ago. This supercontinent subsequently broke apart into several continental pieces, since Wagner's hypothesis, substantial fossil and geological evidence has been compiled to validate the continental drift theory as a legitimate theory. Now, understand theory is still theory. Uh, the theory is supported by uh, evidence as it uh, presents itself. And what we want to make sure we keep in mind here today is that scientific study and research by observation into cause and effect is also subject to scientific interpretation. And we're going to be looking at uh, some, shall we say, non-standard interpretations as far as the academic science world today. <clears throat> Lithosphere and asthenosphere. Continental drift is explained through the activity of tectonic plates. According to plate tectonic theory, the Earth's lithosphere a uh, lithosphere, which is composed of the crust and a portion of the upper mantle, is broken up into plates that float independently on the top of the more liquid asthenosphere. There are eight major plates and many minor plates, which move relative to each other at plate boundaries. Plate boundaries are defined as convergent or colliding, divergent or transformed. Partitions. Plate and plate boundaries. Tectonic plates are divided into continental plates and ocean plates. At convergent boundaries, subduction takes place as one plate slides beneath the other, recycling the plate material into the mantle. With convergent oceanic plates, subduction always occurs. Ocean plates also now always subduct below continental plates. Now, there are a few exceptions. So this statement right here, I want to stop and talk about in just a moment. We do have areas where we have land masses that are not built up 
in this way. Uh, an example would be the Hawaiian Islands. They're built up by a different process. Often producing zones of volcanic activity and earthquake faults, such as occur along the west coast of the United States. With colliding continental plates, neither may, sub neither may subduct, resulting in rising continental crust and the building of mountains and plateaus. The Himalayas are an example of mountains produced by the convergence of continental plates. It's simply saying that uh, these are land masses with no ocean over them that are also moving along lines where they have a, a fault between the submergent and convergent plates. <clears throat> sea floor spreading. As the litmosphere is recycled due to plate subduction, additional crust is created at divergent plate boundaries. Most divergent boundaries occur between oceanic plates with the greatest amount of crust formation occurring at mid-ocean ridges. At these boundaries, as the plates move away from each other, volcanic activity results in molten magma rising from the mantle to fill the open space. Activity can be pronounced at some divergent boundaries, resulting in volcanic islands such as, uh, such as the Hawaiian Islands and other volcanic islands of the Pacific. Earth's crust. The crust of the Earth's outermost layer. It ranges in thickness from 10 to 65 kilometers, with the outermost 35 kilometers being brittle enough to produce earthquakes. The boundary between the crust and the mantle below it is called the Mothorific Dynic Discontinuity, or MOHO. Uh, excuse my pronunciation of the word. Um, the outermost area where we experience the earthquake activity, uh, they're saying is uh, on average around 35 kilometers. Um, it could vary in thickness, of course. But it, uh, it's just saying basically it's not of a, of a molten or fluid and it, uh, it's brittle. Therefore we produce these, uh, large movements of friction between the, the earth movements, uh, uh, one mass against the other, causing the earthquakes. The mantle. The mantle comprises the main bulk of the earth and varies in depth from about 40 to 3,480 kilometers. Look what a range we're talking about here. It is the layer between the crust and the metallic core of the planet. Pretty easy to determine we have a metallic core. The one, one thing is we know there's iron because of uh, the uh, dynamic effects of the movement in the Earth's interior creates a very powerful electromagnetic field. God in his wisdom put things together very well. Uh, that electromagnetic field protects us from very dangerous solar winds and cosmic uh, uh, radiation. The uppermost part of the mantle is rigid, and with the crust forms the plates of plate tectonics. I'm not the mantle. The lithosphere. The lithosphere refers to the crust and the uppermost portion of the mantle, and is the solid outer part of the earth. It is about 100 kilometers in depth, with old, of, older lith lithosphere being somewhat thicker than that which is more newly formed. Asthenosphere. Below the lithosphere is the layer known as the asthenosphere. It is partially molten and exists at depths of 100 to 700 kilometers from the surface down toward the core. It is marked by low seismic wave velocities and high seismic wave attenuation. The lithosphere is pushed down into the asthenosphere during subduction. So what is subduction? Subduction is the process of the lithosphere of one plate sliding down and below another plate, which of course the other plate is being pushed up when that happens. When the plate 
two plates converge. The areas between the two plates are called the subduction zones and are found at convergent plate boundaries. In order for subduction to occur, one, place must, uh, one plate must be heavier than the other. These boundaries are hotbeds of geologic change. Plate boundaries. There are three kinds of plate boundaries, divergent, convergent, and transform boundaries. All plate movement affects the other plates. Though they move at different relative speeds and somewhat independently of each other, the energies released at these boundaries transforms Earth's surface in a variety of ways. Give me one here. Divergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries are where plates are pulled apart and new crust is being created. Oceans are born and grow wider as plates diverge. Rifts are formed from land masses or affected by divergent boundaries. Iceland is splitting along the divergent boundary known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and will eventually split into two separate land masses. That's over a very long period of time. Assuming the Earth hang is still here. Convergent boundaries. At convergent boundaries, crust is recycled as one plate is subducted beneath the other plate. There are three types of convergent boundaries. Oceanic plates push into and are subducted beneath the continental plate, forming mountain ranges. These boundaries also produce strong earthquakes. Deep ocean trenches, such as the Mariana, <clears throat> trench in the Pacific Ocean uh, excuse me, are caused by two oceanic plates converging. These, this convergence also creates volcanic island arcs. The convergence of two continental plates does not result in subduction as they are relatively light. When they meet, the crust buckles and is pushed upwards. A prime example of this type of convergence is the Himalayan mountains and the Tibetan Plateau, highest mountains in the world. Transform boundaries. Transform boundaries are where two plates are sliding horizontally past each other. They are more commonly known as faults. Most are found on the ocean floor, though some do occur on land. Some of the most famous is the San Andreas Fault in California. It is almost 1,300 kilometers, kilometers in length and has been moving at a rate of about 5 centimeters per year for 10 million years. Estimates. Pressure builds up along these boundaries and is released by earthquakes. Pangea, or Pangea. In the history of plate tectonics, there was a supercontinent, as according to plate tectonics theory, of course, there was a supercontinent known as Pangaea about 225 million years ago. It was broken into smaller pieces due to the movement of the tectonic plates and drifted to form the continents we know today. That basically is the continental drift theory uh, and it's uh, basic where they start from is Pangaea. So that date they, they mark as 225 million years ago. Tectonic plates are large sections of the Earth's crust that extend about 100 kilometers below the Earth's surface. These plates interlock like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and slowly move over the course of millions of years. Now, we're going to talk about this over the course of millions of years. Uh, that's uh, interpretation of scientific uh, measurements based on observation, and that is due to interpretation that these numbers are arrived at. We're going to talk about that. When two adjoining plates move relative to each other, this can result in <coughs> formation of earthquakes and a host of other ge geological phenomena. Very important to remember that. They can result in earthquakes and a host of other geological phenomena. Remember that. 
Tectonic motion is caused by several forces. Now that's important to remember. Is caused by several forces, not just one or two. Several things influence and become factors in the movement of this tectonic motion, including gravity, very important that you know gravity, Earth's rotation and heat convection. We all know about that from school. A tectonic plate moves when the denser, more fluid layers of the Earth that lies upon move as a result of these forces. I want you to remember gravity. We're going to talk about that. The tectonic plates and their boundaries. There are seven major primary tectonic plates and numerous smaller secondary and tertiary plates. These plates are part of the lithosphere, a layer of comparatively light and brittle rock that lies on top of a layer called the asthenosphere, which is rendered semi-fluid due to the immense temperature and pressure it is subjected to. Kind of a plastic. The asthenosphere moves up. Oh, I say plastic. I'm not talking about chemically plastic. I'm just talking about uh, forces movement goes. The asthenosphere moves up to several centimeters per a, a year, causing the overlying tectonic plates to move as well. When two plates converge, they collide and form a mountain range. Similarly. When they diverge, they form a valley, a rift, or ridge. Additionally, tectonic plates can move laterally relative to each other, as is the case of the San Andreas Fault. Volcanic activity and earthquakes are common at these boundaries. The Earth's crust is often thinner in these areas, and sudden slippage of adjoining plates can occur when pressure builds up, such as is predicted in the San Andreas Fault area. Slippage. Mantle convection. The middle layers of the earth between the core and the crust are called the mantle. We're getting there, folks. I'm going to keep you too long today. Heated from below by the radioactive decay of uranium and cool. Notice that in that beat. It's heated from below by the radioactive decay of natural uranium and cooled from above by passive dissipation, uh, dissipation and volcanic activity. All of this is in dynamic, by the way. Some of this heat is also transformed into movement. Differences in heat and density act on the mantle like a giant conveyor belt, moving several centimeters per year. This is perhaps the greatest contributor to tectonic movement. <clears throat> Gravitational forces. The Earth's gravity exerts tremendous pressure upon the mantle and core layers due to local differences in density and thickness. However, this uh, pressure isn't completely uniform. This difference in gravitational stress on the deep layers determines the direction that the asthenosphere beneath the tectonic plates will move. Gravity is the main controlling force here and hence determines the general direction of tectonic movements. Remember, anything that affects gravity, remember I said that, has a tremendous effect on our tectonic movements and the movements within the subterranean surfaces here, okay? Tidal forces. In addition to the Earth's internal gravity, other celestial bodies can affect tectonic motion through the gravitational attraction. Very important also that we connect the understanding and the meaning. Tidal forces are not always talking about just oceans. We're talking about tidal forces on any fluid in the earth, including the molten magma under the subterranean surfaces. Anything subterranean is also affected by tidal forces, of gravitational influences. We're going to get back to that one. The moon, and to a lesser extent the sun, both, among other things in space, uh, pull upon the earth, slightly deforming its shape over the course of rotation. This deformation results in internal friction, which translates to heat. Thus, tidal forces contribute to a third, albeit minor, since a uh, source of tectonic movement. Now, these uh, deformations, uh, temporal deformations, 
are referred to as bulges because they are basically tidal and they tend to subside once the force is not being exerted as a concentrated force over a particular region or area. Hemispherical, basically. The importance of mantle ductility. Uh, ductility being the amount that a solid surface or a molten surface uh, surface is able to be moved without fracture, basically. Tectonic plates exist only because the Earth's upper crust is hard and brittle. While the mantle is ductile, in other words, it can be moved without being fractured, uh, as such of uh, forming big voids, etc. And flows like a very slow moving fluid. Without a dynamic moving mantle, the plates would stop moving, despite the continued presence of some of the other forces. We're getting there. Last page. How about that? Okay. <clears throat> now. We're going to talk just a little bit, uh, and we're, we're going to just, in closing, uh, understand that anything that is measured in scientific terms by scientific process is uh, undergoes a steady examination of assessment. You do your assessment, do your interpretations of what you're looking at, and form a conclusive statement or conclusion. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to give an interpretive inclusion, uh, a conclusion to uh, a, a summary by assessment of the things that we look at scientifically, that we explain and talk about in theoretic and hypothetical, of what we're going to read in the literature. And we're going to present that in the end. But we've got a few more classes of where we're going to be talking about technicals, of, of things that you just have to know about science in order to be able to make a proper interpretation. Then we're going to take the facts of literature from ancient history writings concerning the event of the Great Flood. And there's some very descriptive things. We're going to always refer it to the Bible, each and every one, and we're going to see where it agrees. That's called comparative study. And we're going to always include our Bible uh, reference. And we're going to look at the book of Jasher, as well as other literatures. The book of Jasher and the Bible are our primary ones because uh, one testifies of the other, so to speak. The Bible legitimizes uh, the book of Jasher. And we're also going to look at other books which are not necessarily uh, testified of in the Bible, such as the book of Enoch. Uh, the books of Enoch are older than the New Testament. And they are legitimate now, especially since they've been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, before that, there was some thought among the uh, theologians at the Vatican that it might have been some fraudulent document that some smart person created around 200 A.D. Well, lo and behold, they found copies that were 600 years older in existence in the Dead Sea Scroll artifacts. So there goes that theory out the window. So it's definitely a very old document, has a lot to say about the times of the flood of Noah. So we're going to include it in the mix and a few other things, uh, just historical statements such as Josephus and others. Um, and we're going to put all that in the mix and we're going to come up with a picture. We're going to look at some scientific um, uh, hypotheses of uh, what actually could have caused such a stir of events, both geophysical and meteorological that could have pot and even astrophysical, that could have uh, contributed to what God caused to happen. God caused everything. Uh, God allowed everything. What he didn't cause, he allowed. So I want to say that uh, right now. I also want to mention to the students, uh, we have a long-term goal, as you know. I have a vision that the Lord has given me that someday we will establish, we're, we're, we're hoping to find a building very soon and that the Lord will provide the means that we can afford to establish a church in Central Texas in the Bandera area and, and give it a physical facility. And from there, we also want to go and establish Bible school institution. We want to have a theology college. And we're going to have some very talented, very good people involved in all these efforts. 
We'll ask all of you to please pray for us. Pray for Central Texas. We've got some good ministers in that part of the country. But God has also given me a vision to minister in that area. I'm not only a teacher, I'm also a minister. And I'm praying that, that your prayers will be with me. I'm, I'm asking you to be supportive in your prayers for us, that God will perform the miracles of the vision which he has set before us to attain. And we want to equip the church all over the world. We want to join together and help us to meet the challenges, uh, both academically and in faith science, that will equip our ministers, our young generation ministers, to make the choice of faith. In Jesus' name, I invite you to be with me for our next class. We're going to be moving into our class catalog number 101-05. And we'll be putting that up in a couple of days for you. So God bless you in Jesus' name. This is Dr. Alan Childs bidding you farewell.